Good evening. I would also like to acknowledge that we are here on land that belong to and was sacred to indigenous people. Someone once said, to feel gratitude and not to express it, it's like wrapping a gift, putting a nice big red ribbon on it, but never giving the gift. Well, I am feeling so much gratitude that I assure you, I want to express it. I know that my husband joins me in being grateful for this opportunity to come to a place that we have never visited before, to walk into a museum that has now stolen my heart. <laughs> and I hope you will not give it back. So to you, Director Jan Allen, to you, Chief Curator Alicia Boutelier, I say not from the top, not from the middle, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you for this opportunity. I also want to express what a joy it is to reconnect with Dr. Shannon Hill. We are connected by certainly an institution, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, but I would say we are mostly connected by our passion for respecting, studying, preserving the amazing visual arts of the continent from which we have all descended. So I guess I should be greeting you all as my African sisters and brothers. There's a well-known African proverb that says, until the lion, I must add, or lioness, tells the story of the hunt. The hunt will always glorify the hunter. Now, I want to create my own proverb because, as you may well know, African proverbs are constantly in the process of creation. Here's the proverb that I want to present. <clears throat> Until elephants tell the story of being hunted for their tusks. The story of ivory arts will never be complete. Now in this talk, I am going to draw on an article that I published in 2018 entitled, Historical Ivory Arts and the Protection of Contemporary Wildlife. That article and this talk are connected to my training as an anthropologist with a focus on African studies and connected to my work as a museum professional, including, as you heard, serving as the director of the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian. In working as the director of a museum that houses historical ivory, my colleagues and I were not only aware of the exquisite beauty of ivory works of art, but also the reality of how the ivory trade continues to ravage Africa and Asia. While historical ivory arts and the ivory trade include hippopotamus, mammoth, marwal, and walrus tusks, for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the tusks of elephants. The central question that my colleagues at the museum and I grappled with 
is whether there is a contradiction in calling for the protection of elephant populations while exhibiting historical ivory art objects. We concluded that these two responsibilities are not mutually exclusive. And here is why. If museums thoughtfully and responsibly present historical ivory art objects, they can simultaneously call for and actively support the protection of elephants and other wildlife while displaying historical ivory art objects. For museums to meet these responsibilities, two important actions must take place. First, museums must take a strong stance in advocating for educational programs about the plight of elephants. And two, museums must vigorously champion the need for comprehensive bans on ivory trading and advocate for elephant conservation. Clearly, museums cannot do this essential work alone. The work requires thoughtful analysis. In addition, sometimes difficult conversations are necessary, not only within the art museum community, but also with other stakeholders, including relevant conservation groups, non-governmental organizations, government agencies, and multinational government bodies. Here's another African proverb. This one says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Working together, we can help to educate the public, including museum goers, about the horrific effects of elephant poaching, the illegal ivory trade, and habitat loss. And we should not shy away from being very clear that while the brutal and mass scale killing of elephants for the sake of profits is associated with colonialism as a period, this barbaric practice continues to happen. <clears throat> In many ways, museums are well positioned to advocate for elephant conservation. In 2017, there were over 67 million visitors to museums throughout the world. That's a lot of people. In this particular slide, you see an image of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. It opened in 2014. Its very first year of existence. During that year, more than three million people walked through the museum's door. Imagine what could happen if only some of the museums that exhibit historical ivory did so in conjunction with an effective historical, sorry, did so with an effective educational program. Such a program would ideally speak to the circumstances under which artists created those works. The circumstances that put objects made of ivory into world commercial markets and the ultimate impact of killing elephants for their tusks. An image, of course, of the revered President Nelson Mandela. President Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon 
you can use to change the world. It is through education and awareness that we have the best chance of changing the public's desire to purchase ivory products. And if the demand for commercial ivory products can be significantly reduced or even stopped, the illegal poaching of elephants for their tusks will end. 2014 was a watershed year in the United States regarding the ivory trade. An official United States strategy unfolded in February of 2014 when President Barack Obama and the White House issued what is called the National Strategy for Combating Wildlife Trafficking. The three-point plan involves strengthening reinforcement, reducing demand for illegally traded wildlife and products, and finally, the enhancement of international cooperation through public-private partnerships. The 2014 strategy was welcomed and received positive feedback. I turn now to a discussion of three topics. The conditions that led to the United States enacting a national policy on the ivory trade. I want to then note the work of the National Museum of African Art in addressing wildlife conservancy from a museum perspective. And then finally, I want to consider ways in which museums can and must continue to advocate for wildlife protection through exhibitions and support of continued research in historical ivory objects. It's not a pretty picture, but it is a real picture. In order to appreciate what led to the United States national policy on ivory, it is helpful to first understand the underlying conditions that preceded the policy. The ivory trade has existed for thousands of years. However, it was European colonization and the exploitation of Africa and Asia as their resources that brought a dramatic reduction in the number of elephants on both of those continents. In 1800, it is believed that there were approximately 26 million elephants spread across the African continent. Within a century, that number was cut in half. In the 20th century, the elephant population was reduced by 97%. A similar history took place in Asia. The BBC has reported that over the last three generations, Asian elephant numbers have declined by 50% with only an estimated 40,000 elephants left in the wild. The continued and unsustainable, unsustainable decline in elephant populations caused by the demand for their ivory ultimately led to an Asian elephant ivory ban in 1975 and an international ban on all ivory trade in 1990. However, subsequent special exemptions to the ban and domestic sales in some countries have once again placed elephants in a perilous situation. In the two years leading up to the 2014 U.S. policy on ivory trade, the United States Fish and Wildlife Services organized what are called ivory crushes. 
events which attracted the attention of the international media and, in fact, many citizens in the, in the United States and around the world. Following the example of the Kenyan government, which organized the first of three ivory burns or crushes in 1989, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services organized its first ivory crush event in Denver, Colorado. At that event, six tons of ivory were pulverized. Subsequent ivory crush events were held in several other U.S. major cities. The New York, the, the New York Times wrote a groundbreaking interactive series entitled The Price of Ivory. That series detailed ivory trafficking and its relationship to international organized crime, the illegal arms trade, and the destabilizing of relatively young independent governments in Africa and Asia. The United States was an initial partner in fighting for and implementing an ivory ban. However, the United States is not alone in combating the illegal ivory trade. Numerous countries have or will shortly institute national ivory bans. In the chronological order in which it happened, you see the listing in that slide of these countries. In spite of the progress that has been made in implementing national ivory bans, serious challenges remain. The European Union still allows ivory sales between its member states. Countries such as Canada and Japan have still not completely banned the sale of ivory. In 2018, the Trump administration reversed President Obama's ban on trophy ivory imports from specific African nations, despite large protests from the United States public. Protests from foreign governments and other interested parties. Currently, several African countries, including Angola, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, are strongly lobbying for an end to the international ivory ban. It should be noted that these countries are home to the majority of Africa's elephants. I want to turn now to the work of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, which you see on that particular slide. The role of the museum, or the role the museum is taking in addressing wildlife conservancy. Beginning with its founding as an African art museum in 1964, through the period when it became the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian, there has been a sense of responsibility to always see African art objects within the context of the people the environments, and the cultures that produced the art. This is why in 2006, the National Museum of African Art began to present labels and educational programs to draw attention to elephant poaching in Africa and the importance of elephant conservation. The Artful Animals exhibition, curated by Bryna Fryer in 2009, looked at the historical and cultural significance of animals in the verbal and visual arts of Africa. 
In addition, we organize collaborative programming with the Smithsonian Network committed to education about wildlife protection. The collaborating museums included the zoo, the National Postal Museum, the National Museum of Natural History, and Discovery Theater. In 2013-2014, the museum presented an exhibition entitled, Earth Matters, Land is Material and Metaphor in the Arts of Africa, curated by Dr. Karen Milbourne. This exhibition raised a number of critical questions, including climate change and wildlife protection. In the catalog that accompanied the Earth Matters exhibition, contemporary Kenyan artist Wangichi Mutu contributed a short essay about themes that she addresses in her artwork. With these words, she vividly described contemporary interactions with wildlife in Kenya's National Park. You see her pictured there. Black rhinos, leopards, and lions saunter right up to your car because of successful controls on poaching in recent years. The elephants are more wary. They are aware of the slaughter of past generations in their strong collective memory. Wangichi Mutu's haunting description of Kenya's elephants points to the responsibility that contemporary audience have with respect to the past. Wangichi Mutu's artwork offers further critiques of contemporary poaching and commodification as she collages images from fashion magazines with images of wildlife. For example, you see here Mutu's 2012 collage from the Family Tree series. It features the outline of an elephant's head, but the skull of this elephant is an image of a black model with closely cropped hair. An image of butterfly wings comprises the eye sockets and human eyes peer out. By employing botanical drawings around either side of the elephant's tusks, Mutu appears to indicate that the tusks of this elephant have been tragically removed. Like many of the artists featured in the Earth Matters project, Wangichi Mutu presents artwork that prompts audiences to consider the effects of consumerism across the globe and its threat to wildlife populations. Do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. This popular but instructive saying introduces the next point that I wish to make. Namely, as we work to protect Africa's elephant populations, we must be careful not to destroy resources that chronicle Africa's history and her story. Here you see an image of an ivory work of art created centuries ago. It can tell an important story in the life of a people long before such stories were routinely communicated through written language. For example, between the 16th and 18th centuries in what is now Nigeria, Owo, a Yoruba artist, carved this bracelet from an elephant tusk and embellished it with images of a lokum, a Yoruba divinity. 
On the bracelet, Owo's carvings of land and sea creatures surround Olokun's figure. And thus a reference is made to the divinity, divinity's creation of the earth. Now, while government organized ivory crushes and bands do attract public attention to the ivory trade, care must be taken not to destroy priceless and irreplaceable works of historical ivory. As the 2014 U.S. ivory policy indicated, the goal is to protect African elephants without preventing U.S. art museums from carrying out their responsibility to preserve, interpret, and share works of art in all mediums, including ivory. Bryna Fryer, who I mentioned a moment ago, a curator at the National Museum of African Art, received photographs of piles of ivory prior to the Times Square crush. She was able to identify and save from destruction two works of historical ivory. These works were created in Sierra Leone and Nigeria in the early to the mid 20th century. The National Museum of African Arts collection of historical ivory arts emphasizes the cultural significance of ivory as a material of status and prestige in many parts of the continent. For example, Luongo Coast ivories of Central Africa illustrate the value placed on ivory within and outside of Africa and point to a much larger systematic economy in which exploitation of humans and animals has gone hand in hand. Recent research on Loango ivories also points to the significance of keeping Africa's historical ivory arts on display in museums. Such displays remind our audiences, which include current, current adults and future young museum goers, it reminds our museum goers that the ways that they choose to participate in the consumer economy shapes our world. From Nigeria, there is this Yoruba proverb. It says, one sees all sorts of knives on the day an elephant dies. For the purpose of this talk, this proverb helps to point to wildlife destruction as a very broad and systemic issue that we need to work on in order to cause change for the better. The history of ivory as a valuable global commodity has been so ingrained over the centuries and has led to the proliferation of poaching African elephant ivory in recent decades. To address this, museums currently have a lot of work to do and a lot of history to remember. In the ongoing struggle to protect elephants and other wildlife, we will need effective media campaigns to educate the public about the catastrophic damage and destruction caused by the ivory trade. These campaigns can be simple and yet quite effective. An example of such an effective campaign is the one involving large billboards in the Beijing airport as well as hundreds of other locations around China. The billboards, an example of which is shown here, is an image of former NBA star Yao Ming with an elephant. The message is clear. The public needs to be aware of the destruction caused by purchasing ivory products. The effectiveness of that campaign is reflected in the results of a public opinion poll 
funded by the World Wildlife Fund. One year after the campaign was launched, the number of Chinese citizens surveyed who indicated that they would no longer purchase ivory products increased by 22%. As the Duala proverb from the Cameroon states, it is not the elephant who wants for ivory. The African-American writer James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed that is not faced. The first step in turning around the destructive consequences of the ivory trade is to admit that killing elephants for their tusks in order to make objects out of ivory is incredibly cruel to the elephants and destructive to the natural environment. Clearly, the ivory trade is an assault on basic human values. Canadian-born American journalist Edward Grayton Carter once said this, we admire elephants in part because they demonstrate what we consider the finest human traits, empathy, self-awareness, and social intelligence. But the way we treat them puts on display the very worst of human behavior. I believe that we can change human behavior. Indeed, I believe we can change the world. As my Shiro, the anthropologist, Margaret Mead once said, never doubt the ability of a small group of committed citizens to change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cole. That was really fantastic. Um, I truly appreciate that I get an opportunity to sit with you after knowing you for a few years and actually ask you some tough questions because I know that you love tough questions, and so do I. I, when we sat down in our uh, seats and there was a sign that said reserved, I said, I don't think either one of us could wear this as a name tag, do you? She said, no, no. Nope. So, <laughs> let's begin. Education, of course, has been at the very heart of your distinguished career. From teaching to leading colleges, you went on to lead a national museum devoted to African art. Whereas we expect difficult conversations to take place in high, higher education, and I really must applaud the Agnes for continuously offering us difficult uh, conversations, creating the space for that and the resources again and again. Many museums tend to shy away from difficult questions and that responsibility. When you directed a Smithsonian institution, you also served as the president of the American Association of Museum Directors. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. How willing are museum directors to engage in discussions of this kind? Or how did you encourage them to do that? And what can we do as museum goers to let directors know that we really want this kind of programming? I don't think there's any question about a new group of museum directors who very differently look at the question of the mission of a museum. Mm -hmm. This new group of museum directors, and I wish I could give you, you know, numbers and tell you it's X percentage of all museum directors. I am prepared to say it is a small group yeah. that we must grow. Mm -hmm. But it's a group of museum directors that understands that a museum has a mission that certainly involves presenting 
human creativity that takes the form of the arts. But that museums also have the responsibility to make sure that what is presented are the stories of all people, not some. Mm -hmm. And that museums have the responsibility to be convening places for conversations, many of which will be difficult. I, too, want to applaud the actors. Today, when this little grupito, this little group of us, got to walk through the address, I was, I was genuinely not just impressed, but pleased. Am I not coming through? Oh, sure, I'll be happy to. Okay. Because here at the Agnes, I don't know what else to say, but these two sister folks sitting in front of me, Jan and Alicia, with their colleagues, are willing to take on difficult issues. Look at the exhibition on sex. I would say even the exhibition on ivory, which you so brilliantly curated. So the, the challenge is to socially reproduce folk like the sister director and the sister curator. <laughs> so that around the world, we have courageous leadership in our museums. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, among the uh, nations, I'm going to jump forward a little bit to okay. reference one of your slides and get us back to Africa a little bit. Uh, I was struck that Kenya was not listed among the nations that you listed to have signed the international ban on treaty, uh, ban on ivory. After all, since it was the first to draw global attention to elephants' plight by organizing its public destruction of ivory in 1989. So southern Africa aside, and I'm very disappointed about that. Um, how are governments and museum professionals elsewhere on the continent addressing this vital issue? Let me say that I wish, I'm gonna do it, is that good? Um, let me just say that I wish I could describe this vigorous, committed band across the continent yeah. of museum professionals taking a position on the ivory trade, I can't. But just as I commented on your first question, I can say that there are some museum professionals who are very, if I can try to be hip, woke on the whole question of historical and current African art objects. Mm -hmm. We gotta grow that group of professionals. Yeah. Thank you. The United States followed Kenya's example, and I love, I love that. The, this case models the kind of interaction many of us devoted to African art would like to see, mm -hmm. a deep engagement with people on the continent, and a serious commitment to listening and collaborating rather than leading a charge. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you've done some very significant work in that regard, so could you please tell us about a project that you've undertaken or more than one, if you would like, that exemplifies how museums can listen to their African-based colleagues uh, and their con counterparts there mm -hmm. and develop collaborations. Mm -hmm. I'd love to. I'd love to, to share a particular story that says something beyond what you've asked. OK. <clears throat> it says, listen to the people. It says respect the people. It says work with the people. Mm -hmm. So, a number of years ago at the National Museum of African Art, a purchase was made of the photographs of a well-known Nigerian photographer. His name, Chief Solomon Osage Alonge. He grew up, was born and grew up in Nigeria in a part of that 
nation called Benin City. For 60 years, he was the official photographer for the Oba of Benin. The Oba is the most revered both um, religious and political leader. Mm -hmm. So imagine what he captured. Among his famous photographs is in fact the day that the Queen of England came mm -hmm. to Benin. And you see the Oba and the Queen. Mm -hmm. But Alonge, in addition to being the official photographer for the court, also set up his own little shop. Quite an entrepreneur was he. So in the city of Benin, you could come to his studio, get all dressed up, and have your picture taken. It is an amazing chronicling of the life of ordinary people of Benin. So the museum, where you work, where I worked, the museum bought this collection from Alonge's family. I think under Amy Staples, with the assistance of Brian Fryer, an amazing and grace-filled exhibition was presented. Mm -hmm. We could have left it there. We were having wonderful experiences because people from Benin in the African immigrant community in Washington, in Maryland, in Virginia, would come and see the exhibition and we'd often hear a scream. <laughs> and somebody would look at a photo and say, that's my uncle. So it was a great exhibition connecting the African immigrant community to the museum. But we had listened to the people of Benin. We had worked with the people of Benin. And what the museum did was to literally make a copy of the exhibition. You can do this with photography, mm -hmm. yes. all right? And literally sent it to Benin through a memorandum of understanding between the Smithsonian and the Commission on Museums and Monuments of Nigeria. Now you could say that was enough, okay? But we did something else mm -hmm. and what we did was to go into partnership with people in Benin to literally raise enough money to renovate the museum to which we gave this exhibition. That to me is an example of genuine partnership where we respectfully sent back to Benin what really belonged to them. Mm -hmm. And we did more than just return something. We helped to raise the resources that made presenting that exhibition not only more beautiful, but safer. Mm -hmm. Because we were also able to raise enough money to improve the climatic conditions of that museum. Right, right. A long response, but I think it really is a very beautiful example. And I would say, Shannon, it's of all the exhibitions during my directorship, it's the one I'm the proudest of because it wasn't just an exhibition, it was an expression of a partnership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love mm. that project. I admire it greatly. Um, the next question then relates. It's about it's a question I know many people have in their mind. We discussed it in the galleries earlier today. It has to do with this question of repatriation, returning objects, say, other than photographs. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'm sure I'm going to give a little bit of this story in case some of you are unfamiliar with, with what's been uh, discussed in the past two years. Almost two years ago, uh, President Emmanuel Macron of France ignited an international debate that centered on the repatriation of objects uh, to Africa when he said that France would do exactly this. 
The report he commissioned came out one year later, uh, November 2018. Uh, and since then, museums around the world have been grappling with this question of how and whether to return mm -hmm. art to Africa. Now, museums in France, Germany, and England, as you know, have either laid plans to do this or have mm -hmm. actually uh, done so. So it's happening. And I'd like to ask you, what's missing in the conversation? Mm -hmm. What's at stake? Um, what's worthwhile? Mm -hmm. And then to really bring it home to all of us here, what steps might museums take to assure that they participate meaningfully? And mm -hmm. I know that the Smithsonian had the resources and um, uh, the Cloud being a national museum to engage Nigeria's national um, museums in that way, mm -hmm. but smaller institutions, what mm -hmm. might they do mm -hmm. to have a, a meaningful mm -hmm. impact? Well, if I may, I'd like to, to take that very, very important question, which is centered in your question around the works of art of Africa, and to say that it really is beyond Africa. And as I sit here in this part of Canada, or if I were in any part of Canada, or the United States, I would want us to broaden this conversation to say that it also is a question of the responsibility or not of museums to return usually very sacred art, mm. material, mm -hmm. to indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for my new colleague, Sebastian, um, to say that this afternoon, uh, when we were all together, we had a very rich conversation about this. Yeah. And I was pleased to see that Sebastian and I, although we had just met, were really at the same place on this question. And that is that taking either extreme position is not very helpful. The position that says, send it all back. You stole it, it's not yours, mm -hmm. all right? The Inuit people are waiting for their ancestors to come home. Mm -hmm. The people of Africa want the British Museum to empty out every one of those works and send them home. The other extreme says, don't send anything. Mm -hmm. Have you been to the continent? Have you seen the conditions in those museums? Send priceless African art back and it will cease to be in a matter of years. Mm -hmm. First of all, you've got the challenge of climate mm -hmm. and then you've got the lack of resources to care for these works. So we agreed, did we not, Sebastian, that there is a responsibility to, of course, return works that belong to a people. And in many cases, we're not talking about works. We're not talking about stuff. We're not talking about blouses and chairs and we're talking about highly sacred mm -hmm. works. It should go back. But we need to also send or help to raise the resources to care yeah. for what is sent. We also were reminding ourselves this afternoon of the role of popular art in raising a public issue. How many of you saw yeah. Black Panther? Remember that scene in the film where a young man says, it's our stuff, you stole it, send it back. So, in the popular conversation now, the question of repatriation is very, very alive. Mm -hmm. And again, my own position is, if we can sit down and have reasonable conversations about this, 
perhaps we can come up with plans. Now you may want to share that at NAMAFA, there is a convening around such questions coming up. Yes, that is right. Um, the Smithsonian more largely works with Yale University to uh, create uh, discussions in the hope of creating resolutions around this topic. So at the end of this month, on the 20th and 21st, there'll be the second of three mm -hmm. conversations that this consortium has been having. Um, and then the next one will be at a location on the continent yet to be determined. Um, we, ma we make these steps, lay the plans, mm -hmm. and the hope will be that we'll get to continue the kind of work that you did uh, with Nigeria in, in other contexts. Mm -hmm. But the desire is there, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, the desire is there. Um, another difficult conversation to be had around museums these days is that just like monuments, they're becoming sites of public demonstrations. Now there's a collective uh, in New York called Decolonize This Place, mm -hmm. and it has been particularly visible. The organization describes it this, itself this way. I'm just going to read what it says on their website. They say the, uh, the decolonize, excuse me, decolonize this place organizes around issues concerning indigenous struggle, black liberation, Palestinian nationalism, minimum, minimum wage workers, and degentrification. Much of their work manifests as place-based protests within museums and other cultural institutions. Now, their effectiveness can be charted in lots of ways, but one example is the resignation of a trustee at the Whitney Museum of American mm -hmm. Art. Now, you directed a major museum, and you know well that art institutions contend with all kinds of competing interests. So this is my question. How can museums best navigate the interests of their many constituents? That means visitors of all ages, patrons, trustees, NGOs, funding agencies, activists like those who are very committed, um, like those who participate and decolonize mm -hmm. this place. How can we navigate all of these interests so that these difficult conversations can take place? Art matters for lots of reasons. We know that it's up to museums to stage it in ways um, that, that weigh the fundamental uh, difficulties of our mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that museums will find it very difficult to respond to the multiple constituents, mm -hmm. but it's got to be done. The particular situation that you're addressing is not the only one in the United States and in fact around the world. Mm -hmm. um, look at what happened at the Brooklyn Museum of Art where um, the relationship between the Sackler family that is very involved in that museum and the opiate crisis mm -hmm. reached ahead and in fact the Brooklyn Museum took a position that it would no longer be supportive of that kind of Sackler uh, engagement. What happened at the Whitney was that decolonize this place raised a reality and that is that a member of the board is the CEO, maybe it's chairman of the board, maybe it's both, of a manufacturing company that makes tear gas yes, right. that was used on the U.S. southern border. Right. My own <clears throat> position is that these protests will continue. The only <clears throat> hope that I have mm -hmm. is that they will be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. I think bringing one's concerns to a museum when done in a nonviolent way is what's going to happen and should happen. Mm -hmm. I also think though that we could handle potentially difficult situations much more wisely. Um, I'm going to give an example that's a little different, okay. Shannon, from what, what you've just read. 
when the Brooklyn Museum hired a curator of African art, there was an uproar. That's right. Yeah. And the uproar was because the curator is neither African nor a person of color. And those protesting said, here we go again. More white folk mm -hmm. in positions of authority in museums. Mm -hmm. I am willing to bet, if I were a betting woman, that that situation could have been handled very differently if, for example, before making that appointment, making that announcement, there had been an outreach to communities of color to say, come, sit down. We want you to see the resume of this individual that we're about to hire. Yeah. We want you to understand that there is overwhelming evidence that as a white woman, she's done the work. Mm -hmm. oh, she's yeah. done the work yeah. to be able to carry out this position and to do it respectfully and effectively. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example of what I'm saying. We could be much smarter mm -hmm. by the way that we handle these situations. Mm -hmm. We could be far more proactive rather than waiting until decolonize this place or some other protest group comes to make its case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd like to comment a little bit about this colleague that you're talking about, too, because she did something that I've never seen before in a museum, and it shows the respect that, uh, that the public was e expecting. Um, she would have done this regardless, I'm sure, but I will say that there's an exhibition of, that focuses on one work of art, and it was made by a Yoruba artist. So the entire exhibition centers on this one piece. But what was unique is that in creating texts, she created a full text in the Yoruba language so that I'm not a Yoruba speaker. Mm -hmm. It was that moment of not being able to read it and that was a, a really interesting, mm -hmm. jarring moment um, that I think people experience frequently when they don't see their own languages represented. Okay, I have one last question for you and then I'm gonna sure. turn it over to this great audience who joined us. A question that's gonna help all of us, I think, think about our family heirlooms. In your 2018 essay, Historical Ivory Arts and the Protection of Wildlife, mm -hmm. you urged us to distinguish between cultural ivory and contraband ivory. Would you please lay out those distinctions for us? Mm -hmm. um, I ask, again, because if many of you may have objects uh, in your family that have been passed on to you. What do we do? How do we distinguish? Mm -hmm. You know, it's very hard to say to someone, this precious possession that you have is associated with things that I don't think you would be proud of. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to yeah. give it up? Yeah. Um, and maybe I'm trying to dodge things, Shannon, but you know, those sorts of heirlooms, that's not the big, big problem. Oh, I know. We're yeah. talking about ivory trade. Right. We're talking about thousands and millions of pounds right. of ivory, you know, traded for trinkets. I know. And so um, maybe it's the sentimentality that rests inside of me that says, I, I'm really not, you know, interested in going around to everybody's house and saying, bring me your heirlooms, let me see what we can take and have an ivory crush off of it. That's not where the problem is. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to really attack this problem where it is. Mm -hmm. And it is the hunting and killing of animals. Mm -hmm. Well, I gotta say, I got a special thing about elephants now, all right? I'm a feminist. And you, 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 you ought to understand, so are elephants. They are matriarchal. Right. 
they are a herding group. Who leads them? The woman elephant leads them, usually the oldest member of the group. And they move together anywhere from eight or 10 to 100. The guys, they kind of got to, you know, once they get of a certain age, they got to go kind of fend for themselves a little bit. Right. Because the women, are elephants, are in charge. These are all so incredibly empathetic, social, wonderful creatures. And so it's not, it's not your family heirloom. Mm. It's a destruction on a massive scale mm -hmm. of these wonderful, wonderful animals. Mm. Lots of folk have spirit animals, not just people in indigenous um, cultures. Well, I have two. Mm. Wow. One is elephants and the other is turtles. Ah. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate it.